The Unshackled Waves, Episode 94. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company on this busy news week. There's some important political developments to discuss. Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts will join me in a moment, but first I will tell you what is happening in the world right now. Australia's energy crisis was back front and centre this week. We saw a strong indication from the Turnbull government that they will dump the main recommendation of the Finkel Climate Review that Australia will adopt a clean energy target. This is a pleasing development and maybe a sign that at least the conservative side of politics is now willing to wind back some of the climate policy madness. Having said that, governments around Australia are now preparing for a summer of blackouts. Queensland's government is considering measures to restrict energy use during summer, including air conditioners not being allowed to be set lower than 26 degrees. Uh, The federal government and AGL are looking at introducing an incentive scheme for households to reduce energy use during peak times. It is clearly unacceptable in the 21st century in Australia that our governments resort to communist-style electricity rationing. Blackouts and high power bills appear to be the only effect climate change policies are having. The trade unions lost a federal court action against the Fair Work Commission's ruling to reduce Sunday and public holiday penalty rates. Labor is still vowed to reverse these changes if elected. Meanwhile, a shocking video has emerged of CFMU members picketing a mine in central Queensland and shouting abuse at security and non-striking workers, including uh, uh, threats to rape children. Uh, the ACTU has even defended this action, saying that uh, they, they were provoked by uh, being locked out of their workplace. The proposed anti-terror laws from the federal government, which include holding terror suspects for 14 days without charge and having CCTV cameras fitted with facial recognition software, got the stamp of approval of state and territory leaders at COAG uh, last week, so they look certain to become law. It is worth highlighting that opposition to these new laws come from both the left and the right, and is it important that we consider the implications of these new powers and whether they are actually needed. California is the latest jurisdiction in the West to pass a ludicrous transgender pronoun law. Uh, It threatens health and aged care workers with fines and jail time if they misgender a person under their care. Of course, we are told that the law is just a standard LGBT civil rights protection, but its end result of the law is likely to be enshrining all of the 76 made-up genders and their pronouns into law, and we will then enter the theatre of the absurd. The NFL has now called on its team owners and players to stand when the national anthem is played and put an end to the kneeling controversy. They correctly highlighted it as dividing players from their fans and that there are other ways to address the social issues the players claim they are protesting about. There was another flare-up in the controversy with Vice President Mike Pence walking out of an NFL game when the players kneeled. It appeared that the spread of this kneel protest was less about... Uh, Black Lives Matter, and in the end, more just a statement by the NFL players against uh, President Donald Trump. English football plans took a stand against Islamic terrorism in a demonstration in London this past week. They have put aside rivalries with the creation of a new supporters group, uh, Football Lads Alliance. It is not hard to see why these fans have chosen to speak out, given that they attend games with attendances of uh, a lot of the time 40,000 plus people every week, which makes them a large target for some Islamist who wants to blow them up, uh, like they did to uh, those young uh, people at the Ariana Grande concert in Manchester. State elections are coming up in Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania. The South Australian election was shaken up last week with Nick Xenophon announcing he would run for the lower house uh, seat of Hartley and polling this week indicated he has got a good chance of winning it and also holding the balance of power. However, he had to sack one candidate over a photo he took uh, mocking domestic violence. 
Uh, minor parties having to disendorse troubled candidates is nothing new. One Nation, which has a good chance of holding the balance of power after the Queensland state election, has already disendorsed eight candidates so far. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. Yeah, um, g'day Tim. It's uh, it's great to be back for another week. Uh, Apologise for the change of scenery around here. We just had to make some adjustments. Uh, uh, Tim, I understand that you're at Liberty Fest and, uh, you know, I've had my birthday today, so it's been a big day, but certainly uh, nothing more than I look forward to uh, during a day than doing this podcast, Tim. Uh, we're doing this in, uh, for, for those who uh, can't see, we're doing this in the, the dead of night because this is the only time that we're... Uh, both available because, well, I'm not at Liberty Fest yet, but uh, on my way and the the show must go on. So if we have to stay up, then so be it. Well, that's it. Um, Vegas never sleeps and uh, the Unshackled also uh, never sleeps. We're always working behind the scenes uh, to give you the inside information that you need. As a good segue, let's hope that the our power uh, stays on because it's uh, energy uh, has dominated the political discussion in Australia this week where uh, the Turnbull government, they've been uh, sitting... Sorry, on... Tim, there's a blackout. There's, there's a blackout, Tim. Uh, I don't think we can continue the show. I can, st- I can still hear you, oh, so... The lights are back on. There we go. Uh, I'm not sure if our viewer, uh, if our listeners will be able to <laughs> get that joke. <laughs> well, let's let's hope so. Uh, so the the lights are on for the the time being. So the Turnbull government they've been sitting on the Finkel climate report for a number of months now. That now there were news reports at the beginning of the week suggesting that the government is set to dump its key recommendation, which is a a clean energy target, which is it's somehow different from a renewable energy target. Well, I think that as uh, as my understanding goes and, and prior discussions that uh, I've had with you and a few other people um, is that it is uh, basically the renewable energies target that encompasses uh, clean coal and maybe some other things. I definitely hear uh, prominent commentators such as Mark Latham uh, saying that nuclear is on the table. I hear prominent conservatives such as Senator Cory Bernardi saying that nuclear is on the table. So this begs the question uh, whether the clean energy or the renewable energy will encompass uh, both uh, things such as maybe fracking or nuclear or, or clean coal, just basically economically viable and sensible options. Um, and you, we obviously have seen since the, the, the banks have stopped lending uh, for people to expand into the coal sector because you know it's it's a fancy it's it's a cute little thing to do uh, for the the shareholders who are you know ethically and morally superior to everyone who, and who have a great grasp of economics. I think that that in a sign as well uh, is is a great sign that um, that Turnbull and the team. Uh, actually progressing and doing something uh, on this issue and the obviously the summer of blackouts we were expecting to come and uh, it will be interesting to see how this energy debate will both affect the Queensland and the South Australian uh, elections as well. Uh, it's, I know that Turnbull, like, he's got a reputation as being a climate warrior because back in 2009 when he lost the leadership, he declared he wouldn't lead a party that was uh, as committed to climate change as he was. Uh, I, I'm not sure if he's had a genuine change of heart on climate change or whether, you know, he was just going with the times. But he definitely seems to be, you know, w- waking up to the fact that we have got an energy crisis here and s- something needs to be done to you know, make sure that we've got uh, reliable power. I have, conservatives have been saying that, oh, Turnbull's been, you know, too slow to uh, act on, uh, 
uh, this uh, Finkel climate report, well, he has been dealing with, uh, you know, other policy matters such as the, the plebiscite, for example, and uh, a lot of uh, conservatives have been saying this is because of, you know, Tony Abbott's uh, successful lobbying because he just gave a speech in, in London to a climate sceptic institute where he basically reaffirmed his original position, which was, I don't think he actually said it again, but, you know, climate change is crap. Uh, he also said that, you know, global warming, you know, it actually could be, you know, quite beneficial, which which is true. I mean, uh, the earth has historically done well when it's uh, warmer. And uh, obviously, the, you know, we're seeing the consequences of these, uh, you know, cl uh, climate policies, which he did oversee when he was um, uh, prime minister. Uh, yes, uh, I think that that Abbott still holds a large sway on the conservative uh, right faction of the Liberal Party, and I think that Turnbull uh, is more pragmatic potentially than Abbott is on this issue because uh, we will be unable to completely scrap a clean energy or renewable energies target with the current mentality uh, of both. Uh, of people on both uh, sides of the aisle of the House of Representatives and, and in both the Senate, I think that that's impossible. And I think that certainly Turnbull is being a lot more pragmatic because he realises that uh, he has to uh, appease, uh, I guess, uh, both sides of the aisle. He says that, yes, we can deliver a cleaner, uh, more renewable form of energy, although I really hate government interference in the private sector, it's disgusting, but still, uh, you know, it's, yeah, this heavy-handed economics from Turnbull, uh, government intervention, I'm, I'm not liking it, but still, it's being a bit more pragmatic. It's better than uh, having a 100% renewable energy target, which, which Turnbull actually proposed uh, once. So, I think that if, if you're saying that, uh, say, as a, as a Liberal Party member, that, hey, we can't really fight this, this cultural, um, you know, m movement, I guess, or this left-wing uh, secularist religion of this climate alarmism, we actually can't, you know, beat it, we aren't strong enough to, uh, shall we just stab the beast uh, uh, with a spear in his back and get him down and then make a better change. And I think that certainly this clean energy target that embraces potentially things like clean coal uh, and nuclear and maybe even fracking uh, is, is certainly a good uh, step forward, both economically, you know, environmentally and so forth. Oh, yeah, that, that's the reason why Finkel rebranded the renewable energy target to clean energy so it could encompass, you know, non-renewables like nuclear and clean coal, but it's still a government-enforced target. I mean, it's called a clean a clean energy target. It's it's still, you know, forcing consumers to, you know, purchase more expensive and, as we have learned, more uh, un, unreliable power. And it's... It's, it's obviously like this was supposed to be the, the next phase of the, you know, shift to, you know, renewable energy. So it's, it's good that, you know, the Turnbull government is now uh, putting, putting a, break, a break on it and saying, you know, we're not going any further than, uh, you know, the current uh, targets that were set, which at least, you know, things aren't going to, to get any worse. But then, of course, there's also the state renewable energy target but uh yeah they're also like Turnbull's also yeah as you mentioned hamstrung by the senate as well and uh, you mentioned it briefly before these uh you know of the corp uh, corporations the private companies i mean they're they've been just as bad as government with you know obviously the big banks not funding uh coal you know projects and then you have you know agl with their advertising campaign saying you know we're going to get out of coal i mean it seems that the only way we can solve this uh, problem that government intervention caused is to intervene again. Mm. Well, Tim, interesting point you make about AGL. I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to have their cake essentially needed. What they're doing is they're saying, coal is bad, coal is awful, 
we don't like coal. But at the same time, they're selling all this coal to Japan and India, uh, and they're using that to fire their dirty coal-powered stations that, that essentially probably has, uh, in India's case, probably the technology uh, hasn't developed much in some impoverished provinces uh, since the day of, of the imperial, uh, you know, British Empire, um, and they're just polluting cities, you know, soot going everywhere on people's collars, you know, thick um, smog, you know, really terrible for people. Um, they prefer, you know, to ship it over there and not to have these self-righteous kind of activists giving them a hard time and affecting their share prices. Um, but they, they, but the thing is, they don't want to burn the coal here in Australia, where we have the most, you know, innovative uh, coal power stations, uh, simply around the world. Uh, if you look at, we've got scrubbers, you know, it's clean. If you, if you actually look at the new power stations, it's just essentially hot air that goes out the top, uh, and a bit of CO two, and. Uh, in Japan, they're, they're still building, they're actually starting to build new uh, coal power sta uh, stations, clean energy. Russia's doing it as well. And simply, if, if we're not doing this, uh, our energy price is going to go up. We're going to have the highest energy prices in the world. We're going to have the highest wages in the world. And simply, in a globalised economy, we are not going to be able to compete and we're going to fall behind and we're going to be yesterday's news. Well, there are promising signs from the, the federal government that they are wanting to, you know, wind back this push to renewable energy. Meanwhile, uh, we look like we're going to be suffering the summer of blackouts because we've learnt that the or oh, the Queensland government is proposing uh, what I call communist-style power rationing during summer. Uh, you won't be able to set your air conditioning below 26 degrees and there'll be restrictions on how uh, how businesses can you know, power their you know, outdoor signs and, and things like that. And then we learned that the federal government is spending $36 million on incentive plans for uh, consumers not to use power during the summer. There'll be uh, text messages sent out to consumers. Remember how much we all love those. Uh, AGLs offering incentives such as, I've heard, uh, you could get free movie tickets or a free day's worth worth of power and so you know for the time being we're, we're now at the stage of where we've actually got you know this rationing system where you know we've we're supposed to be living you know in a in an age of or in a country of energy abundance and you know this is what we're being told to prepare for this summer yeah um it is very, very, very concerning uh, that we have such limited choice as consumers uh, because of uh, quite and quite renewable energy or clean energy or green energy, you know, or, or whatever the, the news speak of the uh, politically uh, correct uh, left is. Uh, it's simply stifling choice of consumers. Um, it's making our economy awful um, and it's leading to potentially the elderly uh, not being able to keep themselves cool. And now, I live uh, personally about 350 uh, kilometres north, uh, north uh, what are we looking, never, northwest of um, Melbourne and just, uh, you know, I'm just north enough that I get the hot winds from the South Australian deserts. Now, summers can be 45, 46, 47, 48. And how is a, a man or a lady in his 80s or 90s uh, meant to actually be able to cope with that potentially uh, if if there you know if there are blackouts? Now, this this is really concerning. Uh, and you know, all I want as a consumer is choice. I want choice and competition, and I want the free market to do it. The free market will always give you the most innovative, uh, uh, you know, source of energy because people are wanting to make money. Uh, people are wanting to, you know, be the one to, you know, dig that hole and hit gold. You know, uh, simply the the government 
uh, and this this heavy-handed you know economic management simply kills uh, all um, all hope for private businesses because hey why should I invest in clean coal practices why should I invest in having a more you know environmentally sustainable mine a coal mine or, or, or uranium mine if the government's not going to let me sell this highly you know economically viable um, product to the consumers you know purely because of their dogmatic uh, secular left-wing religion prevents them from doing so um, I think that consumers are sick of the lack of choice and they're sick of a government you know controlling their economic freedom uh, in such an egregious and uh, heavy-handed manner and the, the fact I mean this is the the first summer that, well, definitely in my lifetime, where uh, governments have considered such a cause of action, which is basically an admission that the push to renewable energies has made our our power uh, supply, you know, un unreliable. And I mean, you know, where the the whole purpose of this, you know, uh, push to renewables is we're supposed to be, you know, saving the planet from, you know, ca a catastrophic, you know, global warming. Well, you know, there there's no we're not noticing any discernible, you know, impact on the the climate. Not that you know Australia alone could make the difference, but we're definitely, you know, impover impoverishing ourselves. I mean, this is the the twenty first century where you know the with te uh, technology and you know the increases in human knowledge, we're supposed to be creating, you know, be creating you know an abundance of you know products which in which include energy. I mean, you know, we're basically you know electricity. We need it to, you know, function. I mean, we we need it, you know, right uh, right now. I mean, it's we we shouldn't, you know, tolerate this, you know, reduction of living standards. I mean, we're supposed to this action on climate change. It's supposed to, you know, save our living standards, and it seems we're doing, you know, uh, there's a hell of a lot of more sac sacrifice here than we're actually seeing benefit. Yeah, um, I I kind of agree with this I'm I'm pretty concerned about um, well Alex Jonesian type conspiracies that might be coming true about you know uh, global government because with the Tasmanian dams case uh, section uh, 51 of the Constitution I believe uh, subsection uh, 2026 20, uh, maybe was enacted which which says it's the external it's external affairs the term and now that means that uh, by, like uh, binding treaties on things such as, you know, global warming can actually override Australian law. Uh, and this, this interpretation come, came from uh, the Tasmanian Dams case, which was spearheaded by uh, Bob Brown of the Greens. And uh, this, this actual high court interpretation um, gives... Uh, if, you know, international treaties the power to override Australian law. And then you can look in hand with that with, I don't want to sound too nutty and I don't want to lose, you know, uh, credibility here, but the, the Agenda 21 of the United Nations, which, which talks about sustainable development, you know, um, and and potentially this, this whole global warming uh, scam is just a big Ponzi scheme of kind of uh, big world government uh, and redistribution of wealth to, from rich countries to poor countries because obviously we're seeing increased foreign aid all the time and we're seeing countries like India and China booming but countries like France, Britain and the United States you know being unable to to have you know an economic boom you know in the same fashion. And that's also why we're going down this rabbit hole. It, it also reinforces you know my uh, belief that you know the the green left they have an anti-human mindset I mean because they're wanting us to basically you know suffer they're wanting you know uh, they, we've seen you know a manufacturing industry you know shut down they, they basically you know look like they're aiming to take us down to you know the back to the hunter and gatherer days I mean the greens for example they're even against you know building you know more roads any any kind of you know development it's just 
it, it, it reminds me of you know the the fa- the famous you know scene in uh, Atlas Shrugged where they uh, there's no electricity and so they have to use lanterns to 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 signal for the trains and Dagny Taggart sa- uh, says to you know the people that have caused this this is exactly what you wanted you you know anti-human people I mean you know they're, they're, this seems to be you know what what they're aiming for. Yes, or, or it, it could almost be like Animal Farm in a sense as well. Uh, that's an allegory to the Russian Revolution of 1917 where the, the pigs themselves, you know, end up hating, uh, you know, the, the owner, you know, so of the old, you know, capitalist owner of the, of the, of the place. And now if you're going to hate or despise, you know, people who, A, uh, you know, are industrialist capitalists who create jobs, who are entrepreneurs, um, if you're going to hate those people, uh, yeah, that's, that's ridiculous because then you're saying that, you know, I don't want uh, innovation, you know, I don't want further comfort, I don't want my standard of living improved. Um, and, to, and to say that, uh, that humans are, are the, the root of all evil is ridiculous. Now, if you look at other animals within the animal kingdom, uh, they're quite brutal. For instance, dolphins, you know, eat their own babies, uh, you know, lions, gazelles, you know, have you seen the, the or gorillas, the actual violence that these, um, that these animals, probably more lions and, and uh, gorillas, but just the sheer violence of these animals. Um, I believe that, that humans are, in a sense, uh, the, the, the top animal, you know, in the world. We're not, we're not equal with the lion. We're not equal with the dolphin. And I think that, that that's a part of the, the Greens kind of, you know, uh, uber egalitarian mindset is that they say that a human has no more intrinsic worth or value to a fish. And therefore, if one is to, uh, let's say, pump coal into the air, uh, and then to kill a fish, it's it's the same as killing you know humans because both have the exact same intrinsic value, uh, and that also goes to the doctrine of intersectionality, which basically states that that words are equated with violence. So it's I think it is pretty clear to me uh, that you know words aren't violence, and that you know humans are the top creature, you know, in this universe. Uh, and I think these are two facts that the Greens uh, keep forgetting to mention. The federal government's proposing another round of anti-terror laws. Oh, we're always told whenever there's uh, a new round introduced that, you know, this will be the the, the final, you know, phase to put it, put it all, uh, you know, into... It, 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 keeping us safe but this la- this latest round they're proposing terror suspects to be detained for up to 14 days without charge and they also want to roll out facial recognition software uh, to uh, CCTV cameras uh, around the nation and they had a COAG meeting last week where all premiers on site uh, people were even surprised that even Daniel Andrews was on board but I suppose if he is you know for a thought police state, he'd be for a national security state as well. Uh, now, both left and right uh, civil libertarian groups are alarmed, and yeah, I, I definitely uh, am concerned about this. I mean, uh, civil liberties, it's, you know, it's not always a, a left-right issue. And like I said in my introduction, I mean, the, the previous round of anti-terror laws was the metadata laws that apparently keeping all our data for two years was going to keep us safe. I haven't, you know, seen, you know, any any evidence that it has kept us safer uh, from terrorism. I, th- I think, you know, and I, I'm the last person who, you know, wants a, you know, terror attack. I've been on the, I've been on this show, you know, numerous episodes, you know, talking about the threat from, you know, I- Islamic terrorism, but, you know, I'm all Always skeptical of these the, these types of laws uh, as you know the way that you know it's finally going to lead to you know us finally thwarting every terror attack. Well, uh, I think that generally that these things eventually are uh, abused. Um, they of course will be. Um, you know, any power that you give as an individual. Uh, 
to the government, you know, will be eventually abused uh, if that government isn't held accountable. Yeah, and, and after all, you know, sovereignty, you know, isn't given, it is taken. And definitely, you know, I can be a bit hawkish on this uh, in the regard that I would prefer uh, to have a moratorium on, uh, you know, immigration from uh, terrorism hotspots. Um, you know, not necessarily, it, it could, might not necessarily. Uh, you know, be Islamic. You know, the the threat could change. So that's why I say terrorism hotspots. So they're, they're, therefore, we can we can you know control. We can we can curb uh, this issue. And I think that the best way to deal with it, uh, you know, is not to have a police state where the government watches us all the time and, and where the all our data is stored. You know, I, I appreciate security. I appreciate national security. I love our police, our army. Uh, you know, our intelligence agencies, but I certainly do think that uh, this is going too far and I think that the solution in itself is not granting these people visas for the foreseeable future. These people, I mean, anyone who comes from probably the seven countries that Trump listed in his uh, in his moratorium, uh, just just a full out, uh, full out just blanket uh, I guess you could say ban of immigration from terrorism hotspots for the foreseeable future so our civil liberties aren't eroded in such a manner. I mean, uh, what I always point to is, like, the UK, I mean, it's pretty much a CCTV police state uh, over there, yet they have, you know, basically a terror attack you know, every month. I mean, you know, having all these, you know, anti-terror measures ha hasn't, you know, hel helped the UK at all. And often the time uh, after these terror attacks happen, it's the, the terrorist suspect is always known to police. They could have acted, but didn't. Yes, well, it seems that we could contradict ourselves here, Tim, because both of us probably have a trouble with the presumption of guilt being switched around because obviously there is a potential for government tyranny, you know, being able to eventually maybe in the future, not now, not now of course, but not being able to, uh, sorry, potentially, sorry, being able to, say, lock up far-right people, lock up maybe hands that I would necessarily call a far-right if she was causing a ruckus or she said that we should ban Muslim immigration, you know, uh, or she incited, you know, through some kind of interpretation violence and therefore it is, you know, perceived to be terrorism, whether that will actually be used to, you know, whether that will be abused to crack down on, you know, political threats. Obviously, in you wrote a brilliant article about this, Tim, uh, the censorship of the far-right in Britain. So the, the, these terrorism uh, laws can be expanded to include political threats to, to governments as well, uh, and that is why it is, is so worrying. Uh, and I think that the simple solution is, uh, is to have a ban on immigration from pro problematic areas. And now whether the shift changes from, you know, radical Buddhists in Southeast Asia from, say, Islamic terrorism or you know, whether it changes to be radical anarchists in the future who all happen to, you know, be in kind of some s South American and they're all in some commune, some utopia. You know, if the threat changes, I think that the law should change. I definitely blanket Muslim ban is bad, but certainly banning uh, people who uh, or just banning entire regions or or countries that come through if they are proven to be uh, kind of uh, breeding grounds of terrorism, extremism, and kind of, you know, just, a, a, you know, an anti-Western, anti-Israel kind of mentality. A lot of these Palestinian kids, for instance, are just, you know, told from a young age to, to kill Jews. So we need to keep people out who are radical uh, you know, in the regard that they hate the West, they want to kill us and they want to cause harm to us. And we need to, you know, have a, a strict kind of um, a ban on terrorism hotspots. And I think we need to do that now rather than eroding civil liberties in such a fashion. Yeah, I definitely agree. That is the most foolproof way to, you know, prevent the, you know, likelihood of a terror, a terror attack. You know, don't import more people from places around the world where... Uh, 
you know, Islamic terrorism or, you know, Islamism is is known to, to take place. I mean, you know, what, it's basically the 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 consequence for us of you know having you know open immigration is that you know we we get all, not only do we get you know this increase in crime and terrorism but we also get our you know civil liberties taken away it, it's certainly a lose lose and and all this is to pursue the 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 left's you know idyllic beautiful utopian goal of multiculturalism and we can just see how, you know, destructive that has been. Not only has it increased crime, you know, not only has it, you know, caused massive havoc to our infrastructure, but it also has eroded our civil liberties in such a fashion that we probably won't ever be able to get them back again um, in the foreseeable future. We're about to enter state election season in Australia. There's state elections coming up in Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania. Uh, yeah, we'll focus uh, both on Queensland and South Australia because in those states, uh, voters are leaving the major parties. In South Australia, they're turning to uh, Nick Xenophon's party, which is called SA Best there. And in Queensland, it's, of course, it's One Nation. Uh, both of these parties are likely to hold the, the balance of power post-election in these uh, res respective states, uh, which is it's certainly going to... Now, if if that is the case, it's 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 certainly going to lead to um, some some interesting times for, for for those states, and also you know whether obviously you know One Nation and Xenophon they're on the rise at the moment, but we've already seen they they're having trouble with as they as they term you know rogue candidates. I mean, are these you know uh, populist parties you know fit for you know, state state government, and you know, being in a in a coalition potentially with the major parties. Uh, well, I think that democracy, in a sense, has become a bit boring in Australia, uh, purely because the Labor Party is owned is owned, you know, by you know, essentially, you know, activist groups such as Get Up, big unions such as the CFMEU, which. Which have a, a huge war chest. I think 2.5 billion. You know, they're, they're just huge amounts of money um, behind them, and it's definitely seeing you know alternatives now. You know, I think that Xenophon is certainly aligns with Labor on many policy, but he's a pragmatist. You know, he's he's not caught up as much in uh, partisanship as maybe people like more so deal making, getting things done, and. I might not agree with his politics or his outlook, but I certainly do think that having uh, the Xenophons, the Hansons, the Roberts uh, in politics uh, gives a breath of fresh air to it. And it also potentially might get people who aren't, you know, don't feel uh, that they were a part of the democratic system to become a part of the democratic system because you know, it is interesting. Uh, it's not just the same old money behind the same old people with the same old ideas. So I think that this is definitely good for our democracy, you know, and our federation. Uh, and of course, Nick Xenophon himself has entered the South Australian election contesting the lower house state seat of uh, Hartley. Um, but as I mentioned, they're having trouble with uh, ca candidates. I mean, they had to disendorse one candidate because he posted some uh, inappropriate selfies with celebrity wax figures, which included him uh, appearing to punch a, a wax figure uh, of Rih Rihanna. And these are how these minor parties, uh, you know, who have surged... Uh, in various elections fallen apart is because you know they they do have a lot of you know inexperienced uh, you know people who who do do get elected and often you know the uh, you know the power can you know can go to their head and then the 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 party falls apart. I mean you just had to look you know recent history uh, what happened with Clive Palmer's party. I mean he got three senators elected. He got a uh, he he got elected to the lower house and you saw you know um, Jackie Lambie quit and then you saw you know Glenn Lazarus quit and it was over you know before. Um, uh, you know, uh, before the the next election, I, I definitely think I 
you know, obviously do support, you know, minor parties having uh, a much, much greater say. But uh, I, I certainly don't think uh, it, it's good if, the, if these parties have, you know, bad policy and, you know, are just, uh, have a destructive influence in our democracy. For example, I still do not forgive, uh, you know, Clive Palmer for his three, three years in the, in the federal parliament. I don't care how good he is at memeing. I mean, he blocked the, the only good chance we had at budget repair and, you know, I will always resent him for that because we're still dealing with, you know, more, uh, more debt and deficit uh, every year. So, yes, I do like to see a change for, from the major parties, but I certainly think that, you know, any new player on the scene deserves scrutiny. It's, it's definitely difficult because, for one, you look at One Nation's policy, uh, you know, and it contradicts itself in certain areas. For instance, you know, Malcolm Roberts might say, you know, if, you know, economically we're all about choice. You know, in regards to energy, fracking, and nuclear, you know, bring it on. And then, and then, then on the party website, they, they say that they're for a people's bank. You know, which which that's that's shit that happened in in uh, you know communist Russia. You know, and now it's China. They had a people's bank. So, you know, in for one sense they are in for complete, you know, economic freedom. Uh, but in one sense they're for a people's bank, they're for tariffs. So often with these minor parties they can have, you know, conflicting uh, policy and that can be a bit problematic because they don't have a coherent um, message, a coherent vision and a coherent worldview that they can follow. Uh, and if you don't have a worldview and a vision to follow, then it, it certainly does become a bit difficult to to govern. Uh, One Nation, its policies, yeah, you're right, don't don't appear to be updated from you know, 20 years ago when they first formed. But definitely from you know what I see from you know Pauline Hanson and Malcolm Roberts, uh, I personally hope that he survives this uh, high court case. But they definitely. Um, seem a lot more, you know, economically literate than they than their policies do. I mean, for example, Pauline Hanson, she supported the, um, you know, reductions in, you know, Sunday penalty rates because, you know, she said, I used to be a fish and chip shop owner. I know how much they, they, they hurt, hurt business. So I think, you know, uh, obviously she's not running for, you know, the, the, Queen, uh, the Queensland Parliament, but still has uh, a lot of influence. Certainly, um, you know, one, uh, one Nation is the, you know, uh, minor party force uh, that I'm you know, less concerned about. Yeah, well, uh, I'd be worried. Certainly any seat that the Greens get their hands on is a real problem. Uh, Xenophon, yeah, I, I think that Xenophon's good um, for the left. I think he's a good, honest, true lefty. You know, I don't think that he's beholden as much to union power, union sway. And I think that if he's a, a good, true kind of uh, social democrat left winger uh, who's, who's valued base, you know, he's got values, he's got a world view, uh, that's good. I think it's good having some diversity, and I think to say that anyone who doesn't think like you is inherently, you know, dumb or silly is bad as well. You know, I think that this fusion of liberalism and conservatism you know, does as well in this nation. Um, but certainly, another thing w would be to worry about is, you know, Xenophon claims, you know, he is a saviour, you know, a messiah for South Australia, uh, but. Certainly, I don't know how he will fix um, the energy crisis where, where he is a man who supports uh, renewable energy and uh, we, we can see where renewable energy has got South Australia. You know, it's just, you know, an economic, you know, disaster. So, you know, that's another interesting thing as well, Tim. Yeah, it's uh, it's been pointed out by many political commentators that Xenophon cleverly markets himself as uh, a centrist, but the party that he votes with, you know, most of the time is the is the Greens. Yeah, uh, it's it, it's it shows how talented he is as a, a, a politician. But I certainly agree that you know Xenophon is you know is not the answer to. Uh, 
uh, South, South Australia's problems, and let's not forget all the. Yeah, the reason why he's also popular in South Australia is because of all the, you know, industry assistance he he, he wants to give to keep, you know, a, ma a manufacturing there. I mean, he's a big, you know, protectionist saying, you know, I can bring all the jobs back as well. Um, Tim, you pay taxes, yes? Ah, uh, yes. Do you appreciate having to pay for frigates? and for submarines built in South Australia that cost two, three times more than they could be built for in Japan. Do you appreciate that coming out of your pocket? Uh, I'd like I like to see my you know ta tax dollars uh, efficiently spent if I am to be taxed. Well, I, I think that, that that is clear and simple to anyone uh, you know, with one eye of intelligence at Xenophon with this protectionism and this, you know, savvy marketing of cent centralism, uh, you know, you know, says he's a pragmatist, a dual maker, and in many senses he is. But in many senses he is also buying uh, votes in South Australia so he can have a cushy, you know, I think he's been in the Senate for nine years, that's $200,000 a year. You know, that that's quite a bit of money, right? And I think that, you know, he is more interested in buying votes, buying the support of South Australians, rather than scrutinising legislation in the Senate to make sure, you know, that tax dollars are spent as good as they can. I think that Xenophon, you know, was solely interested in buying favours and buying votes, you know, and, and self-aggrandisement. Definitely uh, is good that he is leaving uh, the Senate, I think. Uh, and I think that, you know... Uh, he will be replaced by a member of his own party when he runs for the state. But obviously, we have to remember that he was caught uh, in, I think, uh, the section 44, uh, 41, I can't remember now, yeah, of the Constitution. Uh, 44, yeah. Um, he's caught up in that. So instead of fronting the high court, I think he's saying that, hey, I don't have to spend all this money on a on an SC uh, or, or a QC or, or what have you uh, to to contest, you know, the, the constitutional validity of my job. Instead, I shall, you know, go and, and cop $50,000 kind of cut to my salary and uh, I'll work in the state parliament, you know, uh, and do the exact same thing, you know, uh, you know, buy the votes of the South Australian people at the cost of the South Australian economy. Well, regardless of our opinions, uh, bo both uh, state elections are, g are going to be you know, intriguing to watch. Uh, the Queensland state election could be called at any moment now. We know that South Australia has fixed parliamentary terms, so theirs will be in March uh, 2018. But uh, the Uncheckled will certainly be there to, to cover uh, both, uh, both elections uh, in detail. So we'll certainly be discussing this more. And, and just probably one more thing, uh, Tim, is the fact that uh, One Nation and uh, Nick Xenophon's team will probably both be, uh, sh could, could potentially both be sharing a balance of power within uh, the state of Queensland and the state of South Australia. Um, and, and will this be able to stick together? You know, will this just be more political turmoil? I certainly do hope that uh, One Nation uh, in, co in coalition uh, potentially, or, you know, just work in conjunction with uh, the Liberal National Party, you know, uh, can undo uh, some of this, this mess that's been created by Labor in Queensland. But certainly a lot to look forward to. I certainly hope, I, I'm actually ignorant to Parliament, man, but I, I hope that the Liberals uh, can get in charge, you know, with a majority, not with a not with a balance of power with Xenophon. And I hope hopefully they've got some guts, you know, uh, to actually take down this state, you know, renewable energy target, uh, and to say, you know, let's build some coal power stations, you know, maybe if it's government that has to do it first, you know, so be it. And uh, you know, let's let's frack, let's do gas. And I think that if the Liberals get in charge in South Australia, I can expect a massive boom in the South Australian economy, which will be good for all of us who uh, pay tax. Uh, that, that, that would certainly be uh, f a pleasant uh, outcome, and uh, we can we can certainly dare to dream on that front.
Uh, well, that's all we've got uh, time for, well, uh, this late uh, in, in the night. So thank you, Jacob, for joining me so late. Yeah, uh, good morning, every, uh, good morning, Tim. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I do, do appreciate coming on again, and I do appreciate you all listening once again. I definitely uh, do appreciate your support, your feedback, uh, and your commitment to The Unshackled. Um, just a reminder to all that we, we do have a Patreon and we also do appreciate, you know, any any support. Uh, we also do appreciate you sharing and liking our content. So, you know, the, the voice of, uh, of freedom, the voice of liberty uh, can travel to as many citizens across the globe as possible. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. By the time this episode is released, I will be at Liberty Fest in Brisbane. It is sold out, which is fantastic news for its inaugural conference. I'll be conducting a series of interviews with some important voices from the Liberty Movement, so stay tuned for those coming up next week. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.